one. Me neither. Let's get out of here. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Are you ready? It's time. The inaugural Urban NerdCon is coming to Montgomery, Alabama, July 29th to the 31st. Blurds, nerds, and geeks from across the universe will converge on the capital city to see celebrity guests such as The Last Dragon, Tybok, Megan Tandy, and voice actor Dave Fennoy. Hey, how you doing? I'm voice actor Dave Fennoy with a shout out to all my geeks, freaks, and urban nerds. Just want to let you know I'm going to be there and I want to meet you at the Urban Nerd Con Gaming and Cosplay event. It's happening July 29th through the 31st in Montgomery, Alabama. Hope you want to meet me as much as I want to meet you. So join us by visiting TheUrbanNerdCon.net for ticket and vendor information. This will be the premier blurred event in the universe. TheUrbanNerdCon.net. Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. Nope. Nope. Come on, him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. Sweet it. The all-new Buick Envision, an SUV built around you. All of you. Charmin Ultra Soft has so much cushiony softness, it's hard for your family to remember. They can use less. Sweet pillows of softness. This is soft. Holy Charmin. Oh, excuse me. Roll it back, everybody. Sorry. Charmin Ultra Soft is so cushiony soft, you'll want more. But it's so absorbent, you can use less. So it's always worth it. Now, what did we learn about using less? You gotta roll everybody <laughs> we all go why not enjoy the go with Charmin it's never too early to plant the seed to share the tradition and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones HBCU pride and joy children's boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU visit hbcupridejoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. You see, Head & Shoulders has a scalp shield technology. Protects against flakes, even between washes. It's never not working. Kind of like us. We're never not working. Number 15? That's my rub. Ooh, nice. Never not working. Never, ever, never, ever not working. Welcome, everybody, to Juneau, Alaska. I don't like this one. Me neither. Let's get out of here. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Are you...
Good evening. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to a live edition. It is live. Finally, we made it in here. Uh, it's the ONG Strike Zone. Brian Fulford, Kofi Hemingway, soon to be joining us, Kelvin Rozier. And uh, we appreciate uh, those of you who are uh, coming in. You're probably wondering, well, what happened to the guys? Where are they? Where? What happened? I thought they were going to do the show at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can get the memo that we said 8 p.m. Central. You guys didn't get that memo, huh? Um, just kidding. Just kidding on that. A few technical wow. di- I- issues. <laughs> I could have sold that, Kofi. I could have sold it if you would have bought in on that. Um, right. A few technical, <laughs> yeah, a few technical <laughs> issues had us delayed, but uh, we, we made it in here. Um, had to reshuffle and reschedule a few things that we planned. So, um, you know, now now there's three of us. The uh, triumvirate is here. Uh, Kelvin Rozier, Kofi Hemingway, I'm Brian Fulford. Uh, better late than never. Uh, and so that's what you got. Kelvin, Kofi, how you doing, fellas? It's good to see you. I'm stressed, to be honest. I am stressed, stressed, stressed. But we here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're giving God the praise through this one. Hallelujah. We're giving God the glory. Hallelujah. We're giving him the honor. Yes, sir. He's great and greatly to be praised. But um, anyway, yeah, it's a lot going on in uh, in Rattler land, uh, in Rattler Nation. So we definitely want to... uh, we, we had to come on on this evening just to reach out to everyone in the building uh, and everyone that uh, is a part of this. So we're looking forward to tonight. Calvin, you, you're looking good over there. How you doing today? This how I'm doing right here. Man, my AC out, man. You know, it's, it's been one of them days, buddy. But, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always ready. Ready to talk Rattlers, uh, everything family. So, you know, we we got quite a bit going on and so forth. So I'm I, I'm ready, man. I'm I'm a I'm a trooper, you know. All right, all right. I like well, that light, though. That light look good, and he got the shirt I, I on. Know. I know. He, he didn't got the boy. The teeth looking whiter than ever. Boy, he got the dimples sharp. <laughs> boy, that boy got it. Hey, the beard, it, boy. The beard, the beads of sweat are gonna really show up really well now. You Listen, know that you got this, that, that thing popping off something big. I got to step up. We we, we stepping up in, in um the new year, baby. We we, we finna do this thing. Yes, sir. No doubt. No doubt. Well, at, at any moment, you keep that keep that sweat rack, keep that towel near you, and uh, we don't want you looking like my man in that meme uh, where it's just puddles of sweat. You know, it's just so. <laughs> We don't want you got that. your towel with you though, dog. You got your towel. Yeah, he got, you got his towel. Water, I saw the towel earlier. There we yeah, go. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Uh, give a shout out to uh, the folks already checking in. Uh, Dr. Lori, Karen Griffin, uh, Dr. Strachan. Um, appreciate you guys jumping in early. Folks on uh, Facebook as well. Appreciate you guys. Um, Wherever you're watching us at, please make sure you're following us, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Again, sorry for uh, not dropping the notification. A little bit earlier, we were trying to get the uh, the show out. Um, you know, t- technical difficulties, blah, blah, blah. So you don't want to hear about all that. You just want to know what's going on. So appreciate everyone for jumping on. We got coming up here probably, I'd say, a little bit sooner than we had originally planned. Uh, I believe we still have uh, head baseball coach Jamie Shute coming in to join us in about 10 minutes. Right, Kelvin? Yeah. So coach coach is going to come in. Uh, We we had a couple other coaches that we had planned on talking to, but obviously we had to do a little shuffling around. So we, we apologize to those coaches and we will reschedule. We thank them for giving us that opportunity to reschedule. Uh, but we got to talk about uh, our baseball team. So we're going to start with baseball, hot off the presses. Uh, the FAMU Rattlers went out to Birmingham, Alabama in the in our first year in the SWAC as the two seed in the East. And we represented quite well. 
Uh, we represented, um, we finished third. Uh, I don't think they officially do a first, second, and third, but we were the last team that did not go to the championship game. So I would say qualify that as, as third. We were one game away from going to the championship. Um, you know, when you look at the way the bracket was set up, you know, it's interesting. We really only played two teams, and we played five games, which is real interesting. We played five games, but we only played two teams. Um, obviously, you know, and all of them were in different fashions. Uh, some were dramatic. Some were blowouts. Uh, but but I really thought we showed out well. I, I thought we really represented ourselves well. Um, I just saw the latest Black College Nines poll for the upper division, and we finished second in the nation uh, behind Alabama State, who not only won the SWAG championship, but they were the Black College National Champions, as voted on by the pollsters of uh, uh, Black College Nines. Uh, Fam, you finished second. In the, in the voting. So uh, that just speaks to how dominant the East was. We were the second best team in the East, in the SWAC East, and so it, it goes a long way. So I'm, I'm, I, I think it will get a sense of that when we talk to Coach Shoup, but I, I'm really proud of how we performed. What are your thoughts on baseball team's performance, Kelvin, and then toss it over to you, Kofi. Well, um, you know, we ended the season not like we wanted to. I think we lost five out of six going into the tournament. Um, but then uh, then the first day of the tournament, um, uh, uh, we, we had a lead, you know, the first two games the, the, of the series, um, we had leads, we let leads get go and so forth. And then we were able to overcome one in extra innings to win and then uh, against Prairie View, and then um, one in which we did not win, which is a, ended up being a run one game against Southern, who we ended up winning outside of the bracket. Uh, and then that one, we was up 7-0 um, uh, as late as, I believe, the fourth or fifth inning. Fifth inning. Middle and, of the fifth inning, 7-0. Yeah. 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 And, but Southern did, did that to everybody in the tournament. They did. Including uh, Alabama State in in, in the, in the uh, championship game, I mean they're their yeah. team and they they used to winning. They 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 they're they're, pr they're really solid. They're good. They won the Swag West, um and and they just don't die, man. They like roaches. <laughs> they don't they they just won't go away, man. They 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 never out of it. And, you, and that's a uh, you know a tribute to their players and their their coach and their program, frankly. Um, that, you know, not many teams can be down. I think they were down every game they played almost in the tournament, maybe one. And, and they weren't the down like one or two runs. Against us. Right. So, so um, you know, that's, you know, hats off to them. But in terms of uh, the Rattlers, uh, we, we, we um, first year in the SWAC, we didn't see the West teams. We get off to not, you know, not the Star we wanted we you know we, we you know we were what about 12 games under 500 early and then um you know we we had that peak where you know we got in the swag play man and we just dominate outside of jackson state for whatever reason we just dominated and um so so we got to the tournament and the tournament played out like just like you say i, I thought the east was a stronger side and, and and then you know the last four teams standing were three east teams and um southern so you know, and that's what it was. So I'm, I'm looking forward. We have a lot returning. We don't have that many scenes on this team. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the finishing the, the deal next year. What are your thoughts, Kofi? We didn't win. That was basically it. But I thought that, uh, you know, obviously we competed well. I knew that we were going to compete well. The good news is we did not get one and done uh into the tournament um two and done which would have been for me that would have been a disaster we didn't go two and done we played multiple games um we had about four games and we had opportunities uh to get to the championship obviously the one the biggest the game that was the biggest disappointment is obviously the first game that we had against southern university where we lost mm -hmm. seven nothing we, we were up seven zip and then let them back into the game 
Um, but I was watching another game on Sports Center with uh, UCLA and I think it was uh, Oregon State. Um, they were playing in their tournament, and that game was like 23-21. So, um, UCLA. Yeah. Yeah, UCLA yeah, and UCLA. Oregon State. Yeah. yeah. So UCLA came back and won. It was like a football score. So these type of things actually do happen more in college baseball because you're not dealing with quote unquote professionals that are getting um, all kinds of, um, I want to say, assistance and training measures to ensure their success. Um, you know, so it does happen. It's disappointing when it happens to you, but it does happen. It happens to programs that have uh, many more layers, many more players, many more pitchers than what probably we have to offer. So when I was able to look at it from that perspective, um, it still stung a little bit, but I was like, okay, well, this is just a part of the ball game, and hopefully this will give us a type of motivation to come back next year into the tournament and take it. And uh, and personally speaking, let me say this. I would like for us to plan um, to make events out of this. I think the pep band should go. I think the cheerleaders should go. I think our guys will perform better when they have a group of people that are actually in the stands. Now, I know um, – I don't know what our alumni chapter is like in Birmingham, what the size of that alumni chapter is like in Birmingham, Alabama. But um, just like we follow our football team, I want to see that same energy um, with our Olympic sports, you know, no matter where we go. Um, it's, it just does the morale good. It helps the brand to, to grow and go to another dimension and level where people are thinking about uh, FAMU and how we support our teams, not just team, but teams, um, basketball, same way. I think we should take at least a thousand people to the basketball tournament. I'd like to see us take at least a thousand people to the baseball tournament. I think that that would be, be huge and really speak volumes about how we really feel and support our programs. And I think it would help the SWAC to generate additional revenue as well. And I think that that'll be something that uh, we all can do. Yeah, I think one of the big challenges coming out, if you anybody who watched any of the games, um, when you look at the attendance, and I don't have the numbers, but I can ju you can just look on TV and make assumptions um, at, at various points around the ballpark. Um, you know, Birmingham may not have been a – it was a nice ballpark. I've been to that ballpark. We've, we've done stuff in that ballpark before. Uh, and that city is very accommodating. But seeing uh, the program be able to – or seeing the SWAC be able to do something about attendance would really be great. And, and uh, as you can see, joining us live is our head baseball coach. Coach. Coach Shoup. Uh, uh, first off, Coach uh, <laughs> um, First off, thank you for – rescheduling our time and working with us. We appreciate you uh, staying up a little bit extra there with us. Um, and then uh, congratulations on your team's performance and, and play over in the SWAG tournament. Uh, very fun to watch. I mean, uh, someone someone accurately said watching FAMU baseball sometime is not for the weak at heart. It is fun, <laughs> but it's not for the weak at heart. Uh, we, we keep games interesting, to say the least. So uh, what are your emotions coming out of uh, the, SWAC, uh, the SWAC tournament, Coach? Coaching FAMU baseball is not for the weak of heart either, so I can <laughs> uh, especially this weekend. Uh, I was listening a little bit about what you guys were talking about, about the venue and all. The problem has been is they haven't been able to find a consistent place that they can hold the SWAC tournament every year to, you know, like, Hoover, where the SEC does, which wasn't too far from Birmingham, uh, they've built up a fan base in that area. Uh, people that come out and support the, you know, SEC baseball uh, in Hoover every year, and the SWAC has been unable to do that for various reasons. Uh, this is the first year that SWAC baseball and had a lot to do with us 
me and Johnny from Bethune Cookman joining the league and trying to talk to, you know, convince the SWAC to do that. But this is the first year the season has been the same length of a season that everybody else is playing. Uh, HBCU baseball, MEAC and SWAC had played a week earlier and then whoever won those, those conferences would sit for a week and then kind of be flat when it came to, when it came time to play in the NCAA regional tournament. And, you know, because of being flat that, you know, lessened the chance of us winning ball games and the representation for HBCU baseball, SWAC baseball, MEAC baseball wasn't what, you know, that you usually see on a weekend, weekend base, week out basis. So I hope to see Alabama State uh, do well. They now they got a tough draw. They get they drew uh, at Tennessee, the number one team in the country. Yeah. Uh, their first round, yeah. which I I thought was a little unfair. But uh, you know, there's there's some winnable games later. I don't know if the Tennessee game is winnable for anybody in the country as good as they are. I mean, they got one through Tennessee does in their batting order that has double digit home runs. I mean, they're just a phenomenal offense. They got a guy that throws 105 miles an hour coming out of the bullpen. So it's going to be a tough draw for for, for Alabama State first weekend. But um, I tell you what, it was a fun year, man. It was a fun year to be in the SWAC. And the tournament was fun. Um, we missed a, misplayed a fly ball, and that kind of put us in the loser's bracket. We had to fight to try to get back to the championship game. And our guys really fought. Uh, we, you know, came up a day, you know, a game short to get you know, from getting to the championship game, but all in all, it was a good season, man. It was uh, fun being in the SWAC that, you know, Dr. McClellan, Charles McClellan does a great job of heading the you know, SWAC conference in particularly SWAC baseball. Um, and it was good to be in a, you know, a conference that really cared about baseball. And, um, you know, I think Johnny from Bethune Cookman will echo just exactly what I, what I said, the umpiring was, you know, pretty good. Uh, which has not always been the case uh, in in the MEAC. Uh, the f- way that, you know, other than the lack of fan support, again, probably due to the fact that there's no set place to hold the tournament. But uh, you know, other than that, I don't. I, it was it was a great experience for our guys. And other than you know, playing, we'd like to play in two more games. You know, we'd like to play in the game and play in the championship game, and and then you know, see what our championship end, but. I mean, gosh, if you look at it, we won counting teams that we played out of conference in SWAT. We won, I think we won 27 uh, SWAT games. You know, we had 19 wins in the conference. We were 3-0 and against Grambling uh, in Atlanta this year or in um, just north of Atlanta, AAA Park. We were 2-3 and in the New Orleans tournament. By, you know, and then we were 3-2 in the tournament. So I think we won like 27 games this year in SWAT. SWAT. Coming in so pleased with that. It was a good season. I mean, it wasn't, you know, we fell short, but it was a good season. And our guys fought. And, um, and you know what, too? Yeah. And, and I know a lot of talking and not leaving much time for asking questions, but it was my favorite team. I mean, some of these guys I, I'm going to miss tremendously. Uh, Jeremiah McCullough has been with me five years now. And uh, he's like a son, man. He's just a, just a good individual. Uh, LJ Bryant, Grant Rowell. I mean, all these kids, uh, um, Keelan Fox, you know, all these kids that have come in and, and been so valuable to us as athletes, as students, as people in the community, men in the community. Uh, it is by far, it, without a doubt, my favorite team that I've coached in my nine years at FAMU. And, you know, it says a lot about the young men and the character and the, the way they were raised. And it was just a, it was a special, special year. And I'm going to miss a lot of these kids. Yeah, Coach, I, I thought you you guys had it. Uh, I, I really enjoyed watching the way or really the performance and effort that you got out of your three. I guess we could say our our, our starting three on SWAC weekends um, between uh, um, uh, Wilkinson, uh, Fox, and, uh, oh, I'm free. Hunter V. Yeah, the best guy. yeah. And Hunter Veet, yeah, I, I can I forget I can I forget, uh, forget Veets. and then I mean, and then the, the the hitting showed up this weekend. I mean, w- without a doubt, it, it showed up. And and you know, I I, I heard you say, you know, uh, when you did an interview post game with with uh, with my good friend AD Drew about the pitching, it is so hard at the college level. With I mean, you you see the scores like we went from the first day where every game was a one run game. 
on day one, right, to where we had games that were like at 19-0. Bethune beat somebody 19-0. We beat someone 17-1. Is that just is that just college baseball? I mean, that is just you just kind of accept that. I mean, or is it like you're trying to find those diamonds in the gyms? How would you explain what we saw from the from the pitching? Uh, and, and then the hitting, there's such a such a ebbs and flows. I mean, highs and lows. There's no middle road. It's either far left or far right in terms of either great pitching performances or really great hitting and and sort of subpar pitching. How, how do you how do you describe it as a coach? Uh, you know, it has a lot to do with low income schools. Uh, we are not a full scholarship baseball program. Uh, at least this hmm. season, we weren't because of. Uh, because of past sins of you know us and other sports that had nothing to do with coaching, nothing to do with our players. Uh, it was more of a eligibility issue. Guys were allowed to play several years back that weren't certified to play. They were 3.0 students and better, but the administration didn't certify those kids properly several years back. So we have been paying a penalty for that for many years. So we had you know less than 10 scholarships, around nine scholarships on the field and um, you know, that hurts your depth. And I mean, when you talk about pitching and getting a loser's bracket like we did, uh, then you need pitching to pitch your way out of that and when you're get, you know, win the number of games because, you know, uh, Alabama State won it in four games. If we don't want it, we'd have had to play seven games because we got ourselves early in the loser's bracket. And then we just didn't have the depth, especially pitching wise, um, you know, to, to, to get back in. I thought we fought well but we just ran a little short. We were, you know, we were throwing freshmen out there that last game that, that, uh, that had pitched, you know, some, but not pitched a whole lot. Um, and it's depth. It's a depth thing when it's, and it's based on just not having the scholarships, the 11.7 that, that other programs have, um, you know, hopefully we will be back closer to that this coming up year, because I think this was our last year of, of paying the paying that debt to the NCAA in terms of sanctions, in terms of penalties, so I you know hope our depth can improve a little bit this year. Um, the other thing that, that you know the opposite side of that, we did hit better uh, in the tournament than we hit all year, uh, and but it was the first time we had our lineup uh, on the field. Now they may not have been in the position that I wanted them to be in. But and they never were this season. We never had the nine in the nine positions that I thought we would have when we started the season. Some of it was eligibility, going back to you know progress towards degree and things that the NCA you know mandate from our student athletes from us as coaches to make sure those student athletes are graduating on time. Um, you know, um, some of it was injury. Um, so it was just it was a it was a battle all year to keep our guys, the guys that we wanted. You know. Uh, in the lineup for the whole season. Ty Hanchi is a perfect example. The dude can hit. And uh, he got, you know, he missed a lot of the middle part of the season. And he was, he was a, you know, guy that caught for us too. It was really good behind the plate, but he broke his hand, had to have hand surgery, and then was able to come back the last weekend at home against Bethune Cookman and then for the conference tournament. But uh, I mean, he's a 350 hitter for us. Jer uh, Jared w Weber, another great, you know, player for us. The guy hit, probably played. 100 at bats, probably half the amount of at bats that, you know, LJ and Grant and some of the other starters had, but uh, ended up hitting over 400 and uh, hit six home runs. You know, if he'd have played a whole season, he may have had double digit home runs, which hasn't happened since I've been there. I don't know when the last time that has happened in a family <laughs> uniform. Um, but he had a pulled hamstring, pulled it the second game of the season up in New Orleans at the tournament. He didn't come back until, gosh, the last month of the season. So it's been a battle. It's been a battle physically for me as well. Uh, I got, I guess I had COVID or something early in the season back when we were in Atlanta. And uh, I have battled it even now. I'm still sick. I lost 16 pounds at one point during the season. And I've gained about half of that back and really didn't have 16 pounds to lose. So it's been a, it's been a grind all season from, you know, for me physically and for us as coaches in getting the guys healthy and getting the lineup out there that we wanted to have. But with all that being said, again, I, I was pleased with our fight. You know, we finished our first year in the SWAC, and we finished second in the Eastern Division, and we finished third overall behind the two teams that, that won their sides, won their divisions. Uh, you know, obviously Alabama State won our side, was their number one seed. We were the two seed. 
from the East and then Southern beat us and they were the number one seed from the West. So I thought it was a, you know, a, a good finish for our baseball team. Obviously we want better and we'll strive to do better next year, but I was pleased with the, you know, the, with the guy, way our guys fought and fought through adversity all year long. Well said. Go ahead, Calvin. <coughs> Coach, so I'm, I'm familiar of course with the sanctions, uh, uh, that we, that, you know, were put on us by the NCAA and, and, and so forth. I, I kind of wanted you to talk about, um, on this show, we, we want to educate our fan base a little more on, on the realities of athletics and so forth. So I, I kind of want to talk, I want you to talk about a couple of things that you have to do in your program that perhaps other programs, when you recruit some 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 of the things that they are able to do that you're not able to do, and just kind of talk about, talk and explain uh, how you have the some of the challenges of your program. I, Kelvin, I appreciate that, and that's you know you've been there, you've seen it, so you, you, I mean you know exactly some of the battles that we face, and I appreciate the opportunity for me to to talk a little bit about that. And you know some people may look at it as excuses, it's not excuses, it's just reality. It's a reality we have to coach with every day, and it starts with our facilities because there are high school fields in the, in the city of Tallahassee that are better than our facilities. Uh, up until two years ago, we didn't have a locker. And, and to my knowledge, FAMU Baseball has never had a locker room for their baseball program. We were able to raise money and get that two years ago. Um, so we have to improve. We have to improve uh, as, a, as a baseball program and as an athletic program, especially competing uh, – you know, in, in the, in the SWAC now, which is, they really invest in their athletic programs. Uh, I thought the gentleman and we, we went to the board meeting today and I thought the gentleman said it very, very well about, uh, you know, we are the window that people see FAMU, you know, athletics our fam, the university through a lot of times athletics is that window, that first window that people get an insight. And, uh, you know, I think as a university, we, we need to invest in athletics to, to, uh, so that, that, you know, when they see FAMU baseball, they see a good, you know, a good product. They see a, they see a good facility. They see, uh, um, you know, we do a lot of, I do a, try to raise money every year. We try to, I try to raise personally about thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 just so that our guys can get a couple of the extra things that, you know, other, the big, the other big programs get. Um, but I, I, I was talking to Willie Simmons, uh, obviously the football coach today on the way back uh, or at the uh, board of, meeting this morning or this afternoon and uh, was telling him about coming back from Birmingham. We rode right past um, um, Montgomery, Alabama, and on the interstate, there's Alabama State football stadium to our right on the bus. And that thing is big time, man, that, that football stadium that they have. Uh, so as a university, we just need to invest more in our facilities. Uh, I know that's easier said than done, um, okay. but, you know, we also have get some kind of stability uh, in athletics. And Kelvin, I, again, I know you've been there and you've seen that. I mean, gosh, I, I've been here nine years at, at Florida A&M and, and, and love my time here, but I've had eight athletic directors in nine years at FAMU. Mm -hmm. So we need some kind of stability because if there's no stability at the top, it's kind of hard for us as coaches to know, you know, which direction we need to take our program and if we're going to get supported in those directions. So, I am part of 18 members, which I think is a, a pretty big number to have on a committee that's supposed to, you know, head up the re, the, the search for the uh, next athletic director. And uh, that's one thing I'm going to go into the meetings and make sure I stress is, you know, we need stability. I mean, but, but there again, are you going to get the right person to come in here and lead us when they, are they going to leave a good job to come in and see it into a, you know, to a situation where in the last nine years, they've had eight different people in that position. So it's really going to be a tough, tough find for the committee, for us as the committee. But we got to have some stability, man. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate sometimes that there's so much turnaround for, you know, obviously different reasons at different times. But gosh, I, I just think our, you know, our student athletes deserve that. We talk about, you know, talking to our student athletes and we hear this all the time about, you know, making sure they give back when they leave the program, but we've got to make sure their experience is a good one when they come here. So they're willing and they're wanting to give back uh, just like so many people have done in the past. Um, but we got to get better. 
you know, we're in the SWAC. The SWAC's big time, man. And yes. uh, we step forward in, in joining the SWAC, and we have to take a step forward in the, you know, as an athletic program, you know, an athletic university uh, to support our student athletes um, and give them the things that these other programs in the SWAC are giving their student athletes. You know, we got to compete against some recruiting, so we need to be equal in, in a lot of ways to that. Uh, and that's a challenge right now for us. Coach, I, I want you to cover you cover you you cover the um the facility side and swag facilities and baseball are, are top notch. Uh and so we have to raise our standard there. Uh, and you talked about the NCAA sanctions, which should have been in last year, hopefully this year. So your scholarship levels will be up. Um uh, what you did not discuss is in the recruiting realm in terms of in-state, out-of-state. Uh, yeah. I know that some, some of your competitors, they're able to get Florida kids uh, at in-state rates and so forth. And so just kind of talk about that real quick. Yeah, we're, we're – uh, and that's something a lot of people don't understand either. Um, we are in the state of Florida, and that's a good state to be recruiting baseball players. But that, And that's the good side of it. The bad side of it, everybody understands that, and everybody comes to the state of Florida to try to find players. It's very difficult for us as a state university to go outside the state of Florida and try to entice baseball players and bring those baseball players in when you have limited scholarships to begin with. The reason for that, to explain that a little further, is uh, we are not able to go get out-of-state kids at the same cost we get in-state kids. So we're basically forced to recruit in the state more so than than, than any other program that I know of in the in the SWAC uh, because it costs us twice as much to go get a kid that's out of state because of a weight because of an out of state fee that those those student athletes have to pay. Um, Jackson State doesn't have that. You know, one of the premier teams in the Eastern Division of the SWAC, Alabama State doesn't have that. When you look at and I did this because I had this conversation with our with our last AD and Courtney. Uh, when you look at Jackson State's roster, they have 11 in-state kids and they have like 30 out-of-state kids or 29 out-of-state kids. When you look at Alabama State's uh, roster, they only have eight kids from the state of Florida. You know, they have other kids from Puerto Rico and different places. And the reason is because if they go get a kid from California and that kid pays the same thing to come to school as a kid does from the state of Alabama. We go to get a kid from just in Thomasville, Georgia, just across the the state line, and it costs. If I'm paying that kid thirty percent to come to school, I mean, we can't give kids full scholarships. Very seldom do we give over a fifty percent scholarship for to a student athlete. But if I give a kid thirty percent, he's pay. I, I'm basically paying for his tuition and fees while he's at FAMU. His, his education part, he's having to pay for his living to get it where. I get an out-of-state kid that only has to pay for his living, his housing and food. I have to pay that out-of-state kid 60% to cover his his uh, cost of uh, going to school, his you know, books and tuition and fees and all. So it almost doubles in the percentages that it costs me to go get a, you know, a, a kid. So that's why we have to focus in the state of Florida. And again, it sounds great because there are a lot of good athletes in the state of Florida, but everybody understands that. And Florida is kind of saturated when it comes to – you know, recruiting student athletes because everybody comes to Florida. You know, these kids are able to play year round like they do in Texas and California. And so they're over recruited a lot of times. So um, it's not, you know, people from the outside, it looks easy. Sometimes. When you have 11.7 scholarships or 9.7 this year, as it were, and you have to recruit only the state of Florida, the pool of talent, the pool of kids coming. At, and plus, you got great football programs, you got great basket programs ball programs throughout the state of Florida and you know so a lot of kids aren't playing baseball that might play baseball in another you know state that's doesn't have the football prowess that and basketball prowess that the state of Florida has so it's uh it's a challenge I mean it really is I, I don't know if there's an answer for that because I don't know if you know I, I just don't know if there's an answer for that because um I don't think the university can just I, I don't think the you know, I don't think baseball can waive to, you know the out of state fee for student athletes because that then you have to deal with NCA rules. NCA rule says if one kid if a normal kid comes to school 
then your student athletes have to be treated like that kid that just comes to school that's not a student athlete. So unless there's it's way for every student at FAMU, it's not going to be way for athletics is my understanding, unless unless I'm wrong on that. That's the way it was during my 21 years at Florida State. Yeah. Thank you, Coach. Good point. It's a good point. Well, you know, for me, uh, you know, we I've seen this the whole I want to say the out of state thing has been an issue because our enrollment has been declining over the last few years. So, you know, when you have other HBCUs and I want to say just other schools in general um, <coughs> around the country uh, that of course, as they were affected by COVID or whatever, they decided to waive ACT scores. They decided to waive SAT scores. They decided to waive out-of-state fees and all these other things so that their enrollment, in fact, could be at a, at a point where they'd be able to um, be positively impacted by um, with government funds or federal funds or X, Y, Z. So, you know, just really, I think just especially with this being uh, the week where the National Alumni Association is on the campus of Florida a &M University, this is something that I really do feel needs to be addressed. Um, and, it, it, you know, it, we have to have a strategy to confront the system and the narrative that I think personally is blocking uh, the success of Florida a &M University. I think that if we don't confront it, it's going to remain the same. Uh, if people don't speak up and say, hey, this is this is affecting athletics, but it's also affecting academics because again, enrollment has decreased and it doesn't have to be that way. It's just a simple, hey, we're in the education business, we're in the people business, just because somebody's from the state of Alabama doesn't mean that we shouldn't educate them. I mean, what are we saying? So, you know, my hat's off to you, Coach Uh, I know how difficult it has been. I can't tell you the times. I coached tennis, so I've actually uh, coached out at Walker Ford and, and seen you do the maintenance on the lawn from afar. Uh, you know, I'm like, well, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. All right, so the man not only has to coach the baseball team, He's got to get out there, get in his lawnmower and ride and make sure that the darn field is, is playable. And, I, I, you know, I think that that's, yeah, first of all, that's tremendous dedication because, you know, at uh, really at a lot of our HBCUs and especially at Florida a University, we've made a whole mantra out of doing more with less. But I want to bring an end to that today. Um, it's time for us to do more with more because we have more, you know, any, any school that can go to a major city within the country and have a $31 million impact, a $31 million impact. And we can't fund our baseball program. We can't fund our football program. We can't fund X, Y, and Z. I think it's crazy. You know, just even just off of the impact that we bring to the city of Tallahassee alone during a uh, football season for homecoming. I think that, you know, it speaks volumes about what we can do, but leadership changes that narrative. So again, my, my hat's off to you for having dealt with all of the adversity that we've had to deal with. I mean, you even lost a player this year that was, I believe a pitcher. Am I, am I correct? You yeah, know, that's correct. Um, yeah. you know, Unfortunately. In a it, it was accident. unfortunate. It was an accident, but it happened. So that affects you physically. That affects you emotionally. You know, having to carry that weight, man. I'm just like, look, you know, because you know, when 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 we don't win championships, you know, you have a whole crew of people that's like, fire them, get rid of them. You know, we got to do X, Y, and Z, and blah blah blah. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude. You don't even have a clue. And I'm just like, you know, I've been out to Child's High School. I coached tennis out of Child's, you know, and I went out, I, the tennis courts are right adjacent to the baseball field. So I'm looking at 50 sponsors on the darn baseball field. I'm looking at them continue to build onto that facility. And I look around and I'm looking at the softball field. And I'm like, hold on, wait, wait. 
This is Child's High School. Child's High School. The maintenance is just impeccable at that particular field. So I'm like, you know, when they showed the collegiate uh, in the, the other, I want to say, arenas in the SWAC, uh, the baseball arenas in the SWAC that are top notch, you know, um, that could compete with with the housers and i'm not it's not as big but i'm just saying they're levels above where we are and i think that there has to be a greater value placed on our baseball program we don't have a shabby tradition in baseball we've got a tremendous tradition in baseball we have a valued tradition in baseball for god's sake the alamata says on gridiron diamond track and feel our sons the victory never yield so diamonds in there we got to take care of our baseball program our baseball program has hall of famers we've got people that we've sent to the pros you know there is no reason why our baseball program should go lacking for anything anything at all and this is why this whole thing has to go to the next level um and I'm grateful that you you came on tonight. So in terms of scholarships, if we're fully allotted with scholarships, we're going to have 11.7 scholarships or how many scholarships can we have? That's 11.7 is the full allotment by the NCAA. Yes. And that's for every team, including like your Florida State, University of Florida and everybody else. That's correct. That's the highest you can have in, in Division One level is 11.7. So it used to be 13. The reason it's 11.7 is because uh, when Title IX hit gender equity, it, we got cut male sports. Several male sports got cut 10%. So 10% of 13 is 1.3. That's where you get the 11.7 from. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, but, so, yeah, I'm hoping uh, uh, this year. Oh, that's coach, I, and another thing I was going to say, I, too, when you facilities, you know, there was there was discussion about us getting a artificial turf field, and I thought that was going to happen. There you go. And that fell through, and 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 I'm I'm a you know I'm a purist. I'm an older guy, and I'd rather grass in the dirt. But because our t players, and it's not just me, it's my assistant coaches, my players, spend so much time working on that field, I'm all in for astroturf, man. Simply because we don't have to spend 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after pr every practice just to prep the field. Uh, so we don't have to go out and do the things that we have to do now to get the field ready for practice. Because you're right, we do spend a lot of hours on that baseball field that have nothing I've to do seen with it. practice, but just getting ourselves I've in position. Seen it. They don't have to be done. We do that because it makes our players feel a little better when they come out and the, the field has been properly dragged. It makes our players feel better when the signs are hung up properly and the and the nettings, you know, the uh, windscreen is on the on the fence rather than on the ground. Um, and that's what we, you know, it's what we do as coaches simply because we care about the perception of our baseball program one. I mean, since I've been here, I've only been here nine years and, uh, and I've enjoyed it. I mean, we've won two championships in the MEAC in, in, you know, eight of those years, really, this is the eighth season because you have to take the COVID season out. But so we won two MEAC championships in seven years. So we've been somewhat successful. Um, but I mean, it, it, we since I've been here in the nine years, we have put, uh, you know, thirty thousand dollars. It was a thirty thousand dollars. No, it was a forty thousand dollar project to get a drainage system in right field. Well, instead of doing the money, me and my assistant coaches went out there and got a, a local person to help us with the tractors and all. And we put a drainage system in. That was four or five years ago. You know, we got student government through some help with with um i think kelvin was there at the time if i'm not mistaken and helped us get the scoreboard. new scoreboard right there yeah um uh, and keith miles was with us during that time too to to help get that put in place with with dr Eason. uh we put a backstop you know a, a brick wall behind home plate rather than a chicken wire fence behind home plate uh so we made some upgrades put up my first year we, i raised sixty seventy thousand dollars can't do that every year, but did it my first year because of, you know, reaching out to some of the people to help, you know, help get the facilities upgraded a little bit. We put that hitting facility down there, a covered hitting facility with two cages and, and two mounds in it. So we've done quite a few, you know, things to upgrade the facilities and, you know, they didn't have to be done, but they're done simply because it helps us when it comes to recruiting to have a facility that's you know, a little, you know, again, we put a locker room in, 
Uh, I did get a little help from administration, but I started that process just out of money that we raised. And then once they saw that we were serious about finally getting a locker room, you know, for our baseball program, then they chipped in a little bit of money. The administration did at that point, but that locker room is in Gaither. It's not, you know, it's not at the field. We tried that with that building that you remember down the left field line and we never could get, you know, the electricity to it. We and it just sat there and became, you know, eyesore and, and, you know, people were, shouldn't have been in it at night. We're in it at night. We had to take that down, but uh, we've done a few things, but I would love to get AstroTurf on that field. Just we could use that too. We can bring teams into play in the summer and, you know, make a little money on it just like football does with theirs. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that can do pretty easily that help not only the baseball program, but the, you know, fam you and I, I did, maybe y'all were there today i don't remember the gentleman otis i think was his name i didn't know him that spoke at the board meeting and he talked about it. he put it so eloquently about how athletics is the window the first window that people see the university through so many times and you know i, I just think it's an investment and i don't know i don't know the, you know, i'm not smart enough to know what the investment looks like but with a good investment to a good athletic program uh, man, I just think it helped the university uh, in, in so many ways. I, I see Alabama State. Jose uh, is a friend of mine, the co head baseball coach with their baseball program. <clears throat> and they're, they're thriving right now, you know, because they've invested in their athletics and they're winning. And, and um, you know, I just, I just believe that, you know, there are great things that can continue to happen at FAMU. And, and um, you know, it's just with a little more investment into our athletics. Um, so, you know, hopefully I'll start with getting the right athletic director in. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, as I said, hopefully it won't be the same thing that we've had in the past yeah. with so many, no stability at that position because I think that has to be corrected before anything else can, can be, be corrected within the athletic department. Let me ask a question here to you, Coach Shoop, and, and Kelvin jump in here. Has, has anybody ever – is there a number – in mind when you say, hey, if I if I'm able to if we're able to do everything that we want to do, I mean, within reason, obviously, I mean, we, we, we're, we're not talking about this, the grandstands, but let's just talk about what you need from a from a field clubhouse, whatever X, Y and Z. Have, is there a number? Is there a number that we say if we want to support? FAMU baseball. I mean, is it is there a a number? And and I'm just I'm using for example when I know when Coach Simmons had a need for nutrition tables, there was a number that was put out there. I mean, is there any type of number that's out there? Because I think a lot of times when people are trying to figure out how to give, like I can say to you right now, Coach Shoop, let us know how we can support you. Where do you want people to give? How do they do it? I know we have the uh, foundation, and people can send money there. But I think a lot of times. I think having a number, having a goal and say, okay, this is the number that we need to reach because it'll allow us to do this. Is something like that. Do you have a number? And I, I'll throw that to you, Coach Shoop, and Kelvin, jump in there. You may know some things and have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I don't have a number now. I, I will tell you that it, it, I was told that the artificial turf of the infield, at least, was a go. Uh, I was told once we finished fall ball that it would be done, which would have been November. And then November became December and nothing was done. Then I was told it was going to be done in January. January came and nothing was done. And uh, and then it was going to be done after our first home game when we had like an eight-week window before we came back. Excuse me, came back home and played and it wasn't done. But once we started the season – there was catching up that had to be done. So not only did we not get the artificial turf field because the field had kind of been left alone for so long, um, you know, we had to, somebody came in and took $30,000 just to get the infield playable for, you know, college division one level playable for college baseball. Um, you know, um, so, I mean, it, it was, uh, it was a process that, you know, we, we were actually out there, in a, a roller, a steamroller, a road road roller, trying to get the field packed the, the day of our first home baseball game, uh, simply because it was kind of pushed aside because we were supposed to get our official turf 
and that never happened. Uh, but I don't have a number. There, there was a number. I mean, there was a number for that. Uh, but there's so much that needs to be done from a facility standpoint because there's so much that hasn't been done for so long out there. As I said, it's crazy not to even have a locker room at a baseball field. Um, you know, the grandstand to be redone. Uh, the, the, I would love to see artificial turf or at least somebody come in that can, that can take care of a field on a daily basis because it's kind of like a golf course, I guess. You can't take care of it once every two weeks and expect it to be, no. you know, playable or at least you know, playable at the Division One level. Uh, we are a Division One program, you know. As I said, it's just it, there's just a lot that needs so, to be done. Um, and I think we've been you know, oh, yeah. baseball and other facilities too. I mean, it's not just baseball, but they've been kind of you know getting to it, hopefully, and it never has gotten to it. So. Hopefully one day we'll get, you know, be able to get an upgrade to where our facilities and help us recruiting and just make the experience that our student athletes have at FAMU even greater. So, here, so here. Brian, I do have, I yeah, do I have some say. numbers that I can okay, talk okay. about. So, so the turf field itself, uh, it from a acreage standpoint, is similar to the football field. Uh, the football field installation was about seven hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars to get that uh, installed. I would imagine the same level of turf uh, would probably be. You know, I, I'm not sure what the materials cost is right now in the market with, with you know, things. But uh, I would imagine a uh, properly installed turf field would be around six hundred thousand at, 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 at least. And then, um, in terms of the other things that the you know the PA system, you know, and 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 the stands and the infrastructure needed for all that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, I would, and this is a guesstimate, but it's an educated guess. Uh, uh, I would imagine we're looking at a million and a half at on the low end to to get where we want to get, in. and I would say two million probably is a more realistic number. To get a uh, um, aluminum stands with the cover, so we can have protection from the heat, uh, and um, you know, an in-house PA system, and then you got to do some things infrastructurally in terms of uh, the source, the sewer and restrooms uh, areas and so forth. Right now, we have a, a pump that uh, trying to push stuff up here, and so we have backups from time to time. Uh, so it, it, it's just complete rework that needs to be done um, at, at that facility, and and, and it's going to cost, but it's worth the investment. It's long overdue. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, we can get some of our support organizations um, to start focusing in on those facilities and um, and and putting uh, some 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 money together to to uh, start at least phases of some of the, and I, I would start with at least the turf field as, as coach has mentioned, so that they don't have to do maintenance on their fields. And and they do that on game day too, by the way. Uh, 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 so it ain't just practice. And I would tell you that there is a cost if you maintain grass and you reinstall it down there and, and get all the sprinkler systems working and have the chemical treatments and, and everything that coach is talking about. We've, we, 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 at one time had a company that uh a companies that were doing that for us so we so we could try to have, um, have that standard that we needed as a program and a year round and a year round treatment for that to probably treat that program that includes not just chemical treatment and and ryegrass during the winters and all all, all the, those type of things um you're probably looking at about 200 grand to, to properly maintain a grass field. Uh, if you install a new one, you're looking at another hundred grand uh, minimum. So so you, you're looking at about a half a mil to, uh, but, but but only only a million, I'm a, only a hundred, uh, the 200,000 is uh, uh, rec recurring. The, the the rest of it is to, to take up what we have now, recrown it and, 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 and actually lay it out the way it should be. So those are some numbers of what it costs. In other words, it costs to have a championship uh, athletic program, and we got to be willing to pay. 
to help our coaches and our and our and our players. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, Coach, hey, I want to get you out of here. Let you we've been gracious with your time tonight. Um, Let people know what's next. Uh, What what can we do, obviously, in terms of support? But what kind of future what what kind of plans do you have uh, that as you set up for, you know, the summer and the fall and, and what kind of things can we look for? Uh, from FAMU baseball, from you, and and how can we help? Yeah, first of all, I was going to say earlier, um, we have great kids, man. We had 40 guys on our roster, and 31 of them during the fall semester made a 3.0 or better, including five guys that made a 4.0. Um, this this fall semester, I mean, this spring semester was not quite as good, but I think we had still 25 of our 40 that made a 3.0 or better. So. Uh, you know, these guys are doing the job in the classroom like they should, and that's something that, that goes far beyond baseball. So it's certainly something that we stress as a coaching staff. Uh, and when I say coaching staff, you know, um, you hear often, you don't hear the two guys that assist me every day, and that's, uh, that's uh, you know, Brian Henry, who's been with me for eight years, and then now Brett Richardson, who's back with me. Uh, was when I got the job in 2013 was the first call I made was to to Brett because I knew of his, you know, playing days and coaching days at FAMU. And I had coached Brett in high school and he'd been a, you know, a lifelong friend. So those guys work extremely hard, um, you know, just to, and again, not to, not to try to make it look like this is a, not a great situation because I'm blessed to be at FAMU and I enjoy my, have enjoyed my time tremendously here. Um, you know, when talking about getting better, there's, you know, there's another thing to mention. I mean, we, we are the only program, the only program in the Eastern division. I didn't check with the West, but I did check with the Eastern division. We're the only baseball program in the Eastern division that doesn't have, that does not have two full-time paid assistant coaches. Uh, Brett, since he came back, has just been an OPS worker for this year. Um, so that's the kind of things that, you know, that we need to do better with as a as a as an athletic program um to be able to compete against the SWAC, which is a, a much better conference than the MEAC. you know we need to be on a level playing field with those guys um you know i just that's just one example of of many where you know i think we fall short and we need to we need to do better we need to at least strive to do better um you know so that we can continue to put a good product on the field and and represent FAMU, not only baseball, not only athletics, but the university. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of what we accomplished this year. Fell a little short, but, um, you know, we're going to get back to it next year. And, you know, I like the the prospects of next year. We have a lot of returning pieces. Uh, y'all mentioned Hunter, Hunter Veets, who was our number one guy. As a second team, all swag, should have been a first team. Should have been the pitcher of the year, in my opinion. Uh, probably as good pitchers we've had. Uh, he's returns. Uh, we got some key pieces, you know, Ben cries in our closer returns, uh, Jared Weber, who had over 400 returns. Um, Hanchi, I mentioned him earlier. He returns Joe Perini, uh, hit three something this year. Uh, he returns. Uh, so we got some good pieces and we, we've recruited. Well, uh, this was a good year of recruiting. Uh, you'll see a guy named Ty Jackson that'll come in and, and probably be our leadoff hitter next year, uh, outfielder. Um, yeah, so there's you know there's some uh, local kid that we haven't signed yet, so I can't mention him. But uh, there's some pieces; these are falling into place nicely. So if they continue to do so, then we should be as good as we were this year, if not better, for next year, which is certainly our goal. Well said, well said, and I, and I agree 100 percent with you on on a, on on uh, on Veets, Coach. I, as I was when I was breaking it down on another show, I was I was telling people I was like, don't get fooled by you know, don't get fooled by one perfect game. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to leave it out there and just say what I said, because when you go look at the numbers, Hunter Veach might have had a more impressive number, but uh, it is what it is, you know. But uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Coach. Um, thank you for for just uh, for, for representing our program and, and all of the young men, you, uh, as well as uh, the coaching staff, uh, Coach Henry, Coach Richardson. Uh, thank you. You know, because you guys uh, out there. I appreciate ahead, you coach, saying that. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that because uh, 
you know, that's something too, that, that doesn't need to be left unsaid is that we are ambassadors as coaches, you know, we're, we're a little more recognizable than some people at the university. Uh, Otis, the guy that the board meeting brought that out a little bit today too. Uh, and we've got some great coaches. I mean, we, you know, I tell people I was at Florida state for 21 years, played there was an eighth round draft choice out of there. And since I've been at FAMU in the nine years, I get said hello to spoken to during my nine years at FAMU way more than I ever got to talk to, you know, just by the general fan base in, in the, when you're in Walmart or when you're in a, you know, the mall. Uh, so we are recognizable as coaches and there are some great coaches and what they do and, and, and great ambassadors for FAMU athletics uh, and the university, uh, you know, we mentioned Willie Simmons, uh, Robert McCollum with basketball. I mean, all of them. Uh, they just good, good. You know, Mike Rice with the golf program, uh, Nikki with with tennis. They're just we got great coaches and great ambassadors, and you know, I think with a little help, this this you know, FAMU athletics can continue to grow and go be far, you know, far beyond what we've done in in the past, and and the future should be very very bright. Well said, Coach. Well said. Uh, again, um, Coach, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for representing um, anything, anytime that something's coming up and you need us to get the word out. You need us to help promote. You need us to do anything. You know how to reach Kelvin. You know how to reach any of us. Don't hesitate. Pick up the phone, text us, email. We're on it, man, because uh, we, we see what the work you and other coaches are doing, and that's what we're here to do. So, uh, and, and, and there's a movement afoot, Coach. There's a lot of people. Uh, eyes are opening. Eyes are opening. There's a movement afoot, and we're going to push it. We're going to push it and push hard. And so uh, uh, have faith and, and stay with us, stick with us, and we're going we're gonna to get it all right. We're going to find a way to make it, make it right. All right, Coach? I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on tonight. Yes, sir. We'll be in touch again. Everybody, uh, make sure you uh, reach out to Coach Shoup. Uh, let him know uh, you appreciate him coming on the show. Um, we're going to take a break, come back uh, a little bit more on the other half. We'll be back in just a moment. You're watching the ONG Strike Zone. Are you ready? It's time. The inaugural Urban NerdCon is coming to Montgomery, Alabama, July 29th through the 31st. Blurds, nerds, and geeks from across the universe will converge on the capital city to see celebrity guests such as The Last Dragon, Tybok, Megan Tandy, and voice actor Dave Fenoy. Hey, how you doing? I'm voice actor Dave Fenoy with a shout out to all my geeks, freaks, and urban nerds. Just want to let you know I'm going to be there and I want to meet you at the Urban Nerd Con Gaming and Cosplay event. It's happening July 29th through the 31st in Montgomery, Alabama. Hope you want to meet me as much as I want to meet you. So join us by visiting TheUrbanNerdCon.net for ticket and vendor information. This will be the premier blurred event in the universe. TheUrbanNerdCon.net. Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. <laughs> Welcome back to the ONG Strike Zone. Brian, Kelvin, Kofi, I tell you, man, I, <laughs> I can't even, I can't even. <laughs> uh, 
<clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna try to stay composed <laughs> and uh and professional. Uh EA, I hope you speechless for the same reason I'm speechless. I don't know why you speechless, but I'm speechless. Um, Kenya Sykes, what's the point of FAMU boosters and what have they been doing for the last 30 years? This is embarrassing. God bless you, Kenya. Thank you. Um, I mean, now, let me, let me just. All right. I, you know, I gotta go ahead because I gotta hit it. It's that was just one freaking sport. Thank you. Yes, that's my point. Yes, please, one sport. Please, please understand. That's just one, one sport. One. We already lost men's tennis. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know the track field. You know, the track itself is okay, but the facility is piss poor, if you ask me in my opinion. You know, we're talking about uh, doing some revenue generating type things for the, that I think the family track should be on in terms of the level, in terms of the overall facility. You know, if, if you've got over a thousand people and you're hosting an event, where are they gonna use the restroom? People talk about the restrooms at Bragg. At least Bragg does have a restroom. The track really is has. Is it still a trough? Is it like the. Bruh. They got rid of that. You know, they got rid of I'm that. just saying no, that's just no, one sport. No, no, it's not. A, it's not a trough. They have restrooms, but, you know, they, they are small and they don't have locker rooms. They, you, you know, they use Gaither and so forth. Uh, just in general, there's been a lot of, of vision and commitment to plan out these things, right? What you normally would do is have a uh, athletic facilities uh, um, uh, master plan. And in that master plan, over three to five years, you identify what you need from each program and so forth. And, um, you know, a, a rough cost of what, what, that, what, that, what that is. And then, um, you uh, go about um, getting those funds in place. Now, track is a little different in, sen in the sense that we have an education department and it's under education, actually. That's how I got resurfaced about, I don't know what, about it, seven, eight years ago. Um, so right. there's, there's some opportunities in terms of the track. Uh, there's creative ways to, to get some of those fill in, some of those facilities uh, upgraded to where they should be. But it requires commitment and it requires um, um, transparency, right? Some of the things I know that uh, people are hearing uh, that heard from Coach Shoop, Shoop are hearing it for the first time. And that's a shame because those who have worked internally to try to counter some of those things have taken a hit uh, as if, uh, you know, they, they, weren't, they, they weren't knowledgeable uh, and weren't trying to make those things happen. And um, the issue is way above the coach level and the, uh, the employee level. Uh, it's, so it's we're at talking the leadership about level. So, so we're, we're talking about, about we're talking about leadership in general, all right? I'm, I'm not going to let the board of trustees off. I'm not going to let the foundation off. I'm not going to let the boost the leadership off. I'm not going to let the NAA leadership off. Uh, all these folks I've seen, is they, they come to those games. I've seen them, right? You know, I, I'm friends with a, a lot of them, right? They've seen these things, and um, and they've done some smaller things. They, they've, they've tried to help, but there has not been any uh, accountability in terms of having big vision, right? That, again, the two things that I think are most important right now uh, to chart the course over the next five years for athletics, uh, athletic capital campaign, and then that uh, that campus athletic master plan. That's where everything. In that way, no matter who's the AD or the president, those things still live, and they can still be executed. And everybody knows where we're going. So those are two things I would definitely uh, hope that Rally Nation get behind and and and, and ask these uh, the leadership. To do while we all in Tallahassee 
I hope we do more than just party at this alumni convention. I know the foundation board uh, uh, is here also and doing their business. Uh, you got the, 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 the National Alumni Convention going on and so forth. You got all these people in town. Let's make some big stuff happen. Forget the party. So Let's make some big stuff happen. What role would the P3 have in terms of affecting, is baseball included in the P3? Or can it be included in the P3, both baseball and track? Uh, the P3 that was uh, initially done? I want to say the one that's initially yeah. done, do we need to do another P3? There, there's the, the, there's the P3 can be as broad or as narrow as you want it to be but it and ultimately has to be kind of realistic as to what you can or can't produce and the market can help decide that i think part of the issue why it's not happening is because you have politicians and administrators who know nothing about athletics who in their small mindedness to think of what we can and can't do even though the market, the reason the, the P3 was even done and was put out was because, and you know, we had a response from that R, RFP, uh, IT, and I can't remember what kind of procurement process it was, but we, we had responses and folks were willing to invest and finance uh, the entire P3 project. So the opportunity is there, but but again, I think it's been said over and over until we have the leadership and vision at the highest level and the commitment that that's what we're going to do. Whatever, whatever it takes, that's what we're going to do. And we haven't you had know, that over but, 20 years. We've, we've had but, constant turnover, constant change. It's, it's, um, it's, it's saddening. It's very upsetting and very concerning. Cause again, I'd like to remind Rappler Nation to everyone that is in fact watching, we almost lost our our chief facility on campus in Bragg Stadium. We were almost not going to be able to play in that facility. That facility had not even received any upgrades in over 30 years. 30 plus years, 30 plus years. That facility alone had not received any upgrades in over 30 plus years. That's football, let alone, <laughs> let alone baseball, softball, tennis, all of the, you saw what happened to the darn swimming complex. We had a whole Olympic pool with a team. Parking lot. Mm -hmm. That has now gone away because of a lack of leadership and a lack of attention to detail. It starts with leadership, Rattler Nation. It starts with leadership and it's on us to push the narrative that we want to see on the highest of seven hills there's no way shoot should be out there doing the darn doing the lawn you know him and his coaches that's time away from from watching film from recruiting from talking to recruits to you know making sure that money is in play all of that stuff I got to spend two hours out of my day. That's a, at least eight hours a week. Eight hours a week. Eight hours a week times four. That's 32 hours a month. Over a 12 month period. Come on, man. That, that, that type of stuff can be that type of time. Once that time is gone, you can't get it back. Mm -hmm. You can't get it back, you know, and, and kudos to the team for taking the time to maintain, but that's not what these boys are supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. The team should not be maintaining their own field. 
And we it's still, high school. and we yet, yet, we've got people that have the nerve and audacity to call for this man's job. Go sit down somewhere. Yeah. Go bake a cake or something. Well, well, Kofi, that's why we have this show, though. The purpose of this show, part of the purpose of this show, is not just to entertain and not just to throw pins out there, but to educate. And so that's why I appreciate uh, that some of that is going on. And this leads to, I think, um, before we run short on time, we we need to talk about this budget that was uh, put out there before the board of <laughs> trustees today. We, we let's, let's add yeah. on to it. Yeah, let, let's add on to, to that. Uh, I, I will right. say what what anyone should look. You brought up Childs. I, I and I don't know if we've got somebody on Twitter should find some pictures and images, but we should not. Anybody who's in town this weekend, alumni, if you saw pictures and, and Kelvin, maybe we should tweet out some photos of Childs' baseball field and look Jeez, at our Richard. baseball field. Rickards, ba- Rickards, Rickards has a better baseball field. Okay, oh, not, so, not so next, so so next next Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, I'll uh, I'll, I'll 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 do some of that. I, I have I have but, some of those but, clips ready. But but let let's just say for anybody who's in town, just understand, just go drive by. I mean, it's not far from where you are. You should be driving around campus anyway. But go drive by the baseball field, and just think that's a college baseball field. And there are high schools in the same city with nicer turf, nice, nicer uh, um, uh, facilities, scoreboard nicer stands, scoreboards, concessions. I mean, so so when we get to so alumni, when you get to that general body meeting Thursday, two o'clock to four o'clock in the grand ballroom. And they get up and talking about having a vote of no confidence. And someone should get up there. Someone should say okay. something. I'm, I'm just saying. It, it needs to be known. Somebody has to say, somebody has to have the guts to say, you are tired. You are Look, tired man. of if- your university, your beloved university, being a second-class citizen in its own city, in its own state, in its own conference, if somebody. If it had been up to Larry Robinson, if it had been up to Larry Robinson, number one, we would not be in the swag. We would not have had that uh, that uh, the contract with LeBron. Man, <laughs> a whole not, bunch of stuff let's... that would not have changed. Let me just say that. I mean, because, and I, I hate it. Right. I don't want to bash the man, but it's the truth. Well, don't do it, Nick. I, I get what you're saying. It's let's true. talk about the budget, because because let's not yeah. get you, you're gonna get upset. I'm gonna get upset. We all gonna get upset when we when we mention that. So let's not. We got the people in town this weekend who can make a difference, and they've been saying for the last month, two months, that y'all were gonna stand up and do something. Well, we're gonna find out tomorrow. We're gonna find out how serious y'all are tomorrow. Two o'clock, grand ballroom. Be there, alumni. Now let's go take a look at this budget, Kelvin. That that was talked about today at the board of trustees meeting, uh, which was held today, and I didn't get a chance to watch all of it. Um, where do we want to start, Kelvin? Because on the surface, as a whole, you can come away looking at our budget and saying, "Oh, we didn't. We balanced the budget for a fourth straight year. That's great." But look at what we're working with. Look at our, I mean, I mean, Kelvin's been telling you for how long we should be operating at minimum, what, 14 12, million, Kel? 12, 12, 13 12. million, minimum, minimum. 12, 13 million. We're working off of, uh, how, what is our budget that we're working off of? Nine, nine point five, ten. That's That's what they said, yeah, they, they said 9.5, yeah, that's what they projected. What are some? Let's go through it. Let's go through the budget. And for those who don't, uh, I don't even know where we can put it. Get a, I, I mean, it's out there. We'll post a link to it and how you can see it. But let's go through some of the points that, that you want to get to as you looked at this budget and what some of the actual numbers are and just head scratching things, things that come across that you're like, hey, what? I know I've got a point. So I always go to but where are you at? I, I, I go. I, yeah, I, I go. This is first, right? So the initial proposed budget for expenses was nine million five hundred 
thousand. Um, the projected the projected pool um right now is ten million four hundred thirty six thousand. Uh, 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 and I I predict that it will be higher than that because uh, not all the expenses are are accounted for, and I'll explain that in a second. So right now they projected that it was going to generate nine million five hundred. They're already projecting they're going to have ten million. 436,207 in the expenses. So they, they right at a million uh, in a hole if there's other money that they projected don't come in, which um, by the end of the physical year, which I question, frankly. But then, so that, that's just the expense side. We're saying it costs 10 million, basically 10.5 10 this year. All right, what I'll tell you is that that's how much a minimum is cost every year. Um, I do not understand why we don't start the year, and, and I can tell you this is something I personally uh, stated and to to who it needed to be stated to multiple times. But uh, I don't understand how we set up our projected budget in athletics. If you look at the spreadsheet that they have, you don't see maintenance, you don't see game operations. You you know that you know we got to have security. You know you got to have people to maintain the facilities and so forth. Uh, Come so on now, you don't even. You don't even have that in the projections, right? And I just don't understand why we would, why we set ourselves up to make people think that we're running a deficit, like we're doing something wrong. When in reality, we just ain't showing our expenses up front. So I, that's I, the, is that deception, or what is that? What you mean? I mean, you can see the budget. There's a decision that's made at a higher level that said we're going to just all we're going to show. We're going to say they want us to stay in 8.5, 9.5, and then we lie like we're going to have a balanced budget. And then by the time the end of the physical year happened and all these sports didn't happen, we, well, we had unforeseen um, situations. We ain't got no unforeseen situation. It costs $11 million to run a Division I uh, athletic program, period. And, and that's all I'm going to say right now. I'll let y'all get in. Is that, the, is that the line item that says expense? When you look at the operating expense, it just says expense. Who knows what that expense is? It just says expense. The actual expense, you budgeted just under three mil. It turned out to be 4.4 mil. And then by the end of the year, you're thinking it'll be 4.9, 4.89 mil. Is that, is that what you're talking about when you say, hey, where are those itemized things? Can it be under that? No, no. With the project, when the projections, the expenses are simple. Um, you know, they, they're projecting, um, you know, travel and and you know, you you've got uh, um, some things in terms of, you know, uh, paying the conference in terms of officials and and um, you got you got all kind of administrative calls uh, in that you know, and then each sport has a minimum budget that they send up. That usually is cut with no kind of science behind it, right? No strategy to it, right? The coaches and, and so forth come up and they, along with the athletic department say, hey, these are what we need for these sports. And then some kind of way it gets up to a higher level and, well, we're going to reduce it by 15% across the board, you know, because uh, that's what number that we need to be at 9.5. That's what we do every year. And that's why we have so so discussion. Coach was talking, you know, when we talk about facilities and and, and maintenance and and some of the things that haven't been done. Well, you just look at this budget. I I encourage everybody to look at it. look at the budget. It tells you why we are where we are, and is and it has less to do with the coaches. I agree, coach. We have some really strong, great coaches who take great pride, and they 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 they, they are successful in spite of, not because of. And we need to change that narrative. Uh, for the those thing of you who are is, wondering, where can you see this? Let me let me let people know. If you go to famu.edu, and if you simply, or I'll tell you, even quicker search, just type in famu in Google search, famu board of trustees. Type in famu board of trustees, and one of the first two searches will come up is the committee meeting, the committee of, board of trustees committee meeting uh for june 1 2022 you scroll down you'll see that there was a special committee on athletics right there you'll see not only the the meeting material 
but you'll see the presentation. And in that presentation is a nice little PDF document that they presented earlier today. Page two shows you the uh, 21, 22 revenue, as well as the operating expenses, which uh, has the actuals as of the end of May. Then they have the projections for June 30th, which is actually the end of the calendar year. Then they also get into page three, which is the projected revenue for next year, which is not really more than the current year. That's kind of sad. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. that that's amazing. Um, that's just throwing numbers at a wall, folks. Anyway, <laughs> um, so... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So I just wanted to let people know where they can find that at. Go ahead, Kofi. What were you going to add? You were going to jump in there and say something. It's really best that I probably not speak. Um, okay, so then let me. Now, <laughs> I, yeah, let me. Let me. I do want to say this, though. <laughs> I do want to say this. I, I do need to say this. The oh, Board of Trustees. No, no, no. Board of Trustees meeting I'm, is uh, on tomorrow. All right. They have a point where you have to, you have an opportunity to basically sign up and speak you have to do that at the beginning um of the board of trustees meeting which begins at what time sir uh it looks like 8 30 the actual meeting itself nine o'clock the uh, direct yes. support organizations committee meeting is 8 30 but the actual board of trustees meeting is 9 a.m in the band rehearsal hall. Band rehearsal hall is where this meeting will take place. Um, I'm looking at the agenda meetings for tomorrow. Blah, 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 blah. Welcome, roll call, nine o'clock. Um, I don't know. You said there would be an open call. Wait, is, are you sure there's an open? I don't yeah, see there's yeah. an open. Is there it's Oh, open, public, is that what we have? The AD, the AD, and the does the BOT have anything to do with the with the budget? Or is it just they have to prove it? I mean, they have, they have to prove it. They have to vote on it. Okay, and then the president also has something to do with this budget. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, you do a pro, you know, you do your projections. You send it up to the leadership team. In between, I think the CFO and the president's office, they determine what's realistic and what the board has the appetite for. And that's what we have to get away from. It ain't about what they have the appetite for. It's about what the reality is to be to have a successful program, period. Right. So if that is the case, you know, these are the things that we have to address. When they have uh, the time for the period of comments, on uh tomorrow morning um you know someone needs to be prepared or multiple uh individuals need to be prepared to speak um to say what needs to be said to call truth to well speak truth to power you know truth is powerful really all by itself so if you just go ahead and just hold the decision makers of our institution accountable uh, I believe that we will begin to see um, the seeds of change really begin to be manifested. Um, but we've got to we got to do a little, you know. I want to say good trouble, but I'm not, and I'm not necessarily trying to start a fight. But at this point, we're looking at a cycle of dysfunction that continues because the leaders of our beloved institution um apparently don't have a clue and we've got to we got to make sure that that stops when the right people are in position the wrong stuff will stop happening um a couple of questions from out of youtube and i'm, I'm trying to sit here and try to figure out where that open call is um i for the board of trustees meeting tomorrow um, I know where it is and for the National Alumni Association, I already told you, two o'clock, general, uh, general meeting, two o'clock to four o'clock, grand ballroom, be there, National Alumni. Um, typically, I'm you have to, to go to, Brian, typically you have to be in person, you go there, 
at the beginning of the uh, meeting. And they have a sign-up sheet. You have to go find the, uh, uh, I believe, the chief of staff is usually uh, the person who, who is uh, the quote unquote administrative assistant for the uh, board. And um, but in, in there's a sign-up sheet. You, you go and you say you want to um, participate in public comments. Now they can move the general public comment. Com, public comments generally happen at the beginning. Or at the end yes. of the meeting. Okay. But but uh, but but so, that's 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 the that's the term public comments. Okay, so I, I okay, that's what I thought, but I wasn't really sure because I know I see uh Lawson, uh Mr. Lawson is actually his I guess he's the chair and he sort of will call for that. But that is the third item up. So after the call to order and welcome, you have the roll call and then open for public comments, which will happen before the welcome. So again, nine o'clock is when it's scheduled to start or after the previous meeting, which is the uh, direct support organization committee meeting at 830. So I would suggest to people be in the house by 830, 845, get signed up. So that way, if you want to make a comment, public comments uh, when it's when it's time um, that you are prepared to go and speak. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that's about it. That that's, you know, um, yeah. So there's two opportunities, a couple of comments. Uh, I'm just kind of going through, I know. Okay. I, I found it interesting for me. I found it interesting when you look at that, uh, Florida classic consortium, um, and this actually came out. I heard a little bit of this before I got called away in like two, three other directions as I was listening to this. And I, I got to make sure I go back to to find this. But if you got, do you have the budget pulled up? What are, what are the numbers there on that uh, Florida Classic Consortium, Kelvin? Let me see if I got that one. Let me uh, while he's pulling that up, you Jump know, in there. it's just it's just amazing that we actually allowed this whole thing to get to this point when it comes to even the Florida Classic. You know, uh, you have Orlando who ho who has been hosting the Florida Classic, but normally they put uh, the Florida Classic up to bid after a few years. They they chose not to do that with multiple cities. So therefore Orlando continues to give us not what we deserve, but what they feel like we need to have. Um, for us to allow that to happen is straight up laziness. And it's downright trifling for us to sit here and not give Tampa an opportunity in spite of what's happened, give them an opportunity to bid. If they are giving FAMU more money than Orlando, then Tampa should get the game. If Jacksonville was to offer more money than Orlando, then Jacksonville should get the game. If Miami comes to it and they say, you know, South Florida has a consortium, if they want to do and give Fam and Cookman more money, they should get the game. But to just sit there and just give it to Orlando without any competition to bid, it's dumbfounding to me. I don't get it. But are those well, other let me cities, just... are they giving that? Well, let, let me let me provide Brian, you some insight, Brian. So first of all, to answer your question, we budgeted eight hundred thousand for uh, the Florida Classic uh, revenue. Uh, as of right now, they're saying that we have about five hundred thousand of it, and they expect to get four hundred thousand more by the end of this physical year. So that, that is one of those numbers that I question. All right. Um, the devil's in the details. I don't know what kind of incentives are, where they getting that, those numbers from. I highly doubt that we're going to get $400,000 by the end of this month, though. But, so, but so, to that, go ahead. Well, to answer the sure other question, the question. They, they answer your other question that, that you were talking about in terms of what the other people do. First of all, let me just say best business practices, regardless of what deals you have in place. Uh, and, and almost all universities, even at the FES level, do this with new site games that happen every year. 
uh, you put it up for bid every three to five years. And you do and that's best business practice, number one. But part of the reason you do it because it keeps uh, your whole city from, from getting comfortable and shortchanging you when the market changes and inflates and so forth. Uh, so, so I would tell you that when we were bidding um, the uh, classic out, I know for sure that one year Orlando got outbid it. And then it was an administrative decision. Because By they who? like Orlando. Yeah. What city? I, I'm, Tampa. What city? I'm, I, I, Tampa. Oh, Just what say city? The city. It, oh, it was I'm Tampa. Not put, you aren't going to put people out there. Tampa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was Tampa. And it was significantly more, to be honest. Wow. So, so that's what I'm saying. We got to, and for athletics, when we have a game day, since we want athletics to be self sustaining, right? So when, when we have a football game um, the, the, at the Classic, all the revenue that's generated from that game needs to go to athletics. It don't need to be siphoned off from uh, to go to the university and other things. Um, it needs to go to athletics primarily. Uh, just like, in my opinion, the battle of the bands. When when they do the battle of the bands um, down there, I think the bands should get the lion's share uh, for scholarships. Uh, lion's share of that money for the battle of the bands, and I know that Bethune does. That's how they do theirs. So, so the devil's in the details, and none of this stuff has been transparent and shared with uh, um, even the athletic administration. The athletic administration didn't know some of this stuff or wasn't privy to. They were relying on reports coming from the financial side, you know, and the administrative side, and they had to just take their word for it. So there's there's just a lot of cleanup that we we need to do. But but um, definitely the Florida Classic should be generating a million five minimum for 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 our impact just for athletics. I ain't inclu- including um, the other stuff that they do. It should be easily a million if, five because they give they give three to four million to uh, neutral side games like Ole Miss and Florida State played at the beginning of the year, guaranteed. And if we're making a thirty one million dollar impact in a city, we should at least get ten percent. That's three million per school, if you ask me. I'm I'm just saying, bro. Just you, you ain't you ain't for you. But close mouths don't get fed, buddy. They, they don't get you fed. Right. So the budget, the budget says that we are expecting. If I if you follow me here, eight hundred thousand. That's what the budget said, right? That for that Florida Classic game that we would get eight hundred thousand, right? Eight hundred thousand right. to FAMU. I'm assuming eight hundred thousand right. to Bethune, right? Right. Okay. Right. So far. As of May 27th, we have only received less than 500,000 of that. So just about less than 500,000. There's a whole nother projected, as you said, you wonder, there's a projected $500,000 which are floating and God bless the person on the board of trustees who asked this question. And, and he asked Mike Smith and God bless Mike Smith. Cause he answered it about as bravely as he could. When the question was asked, where is the other thousand right now? It didn't, the game was, when was the game again? The, the, no, when was the game? November 25th, no, November 18th, somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's see, let's do the math. December, January, February, March, April, May. So that's six months later, we've only gotten 500,000 of that. And then next month, supposedly we'll get another 500,000. So that means where's that 500, where seven months that $500,000 has been sitting somewhere. And this was the question that was asked to Michael Smith. Where's that money at? And he said, That's and, not- and I'm paraphrasing, he he said, I, I, I don't have that answer for you, but I have to get it. And God bless him, because that's the only answer you can give, because nobody knows where that money is. And so I don't know why, fam, you can't get their money 60 days after the game. I don't know why it takes seven months to get the money, because somebody's drawing interest on that money. Somebody's drawing interest on $500,000 in a bank somewhere, right? Will fam you the question get is, $500,000 the question is, or will fam you get hey, The question, Brian, is is that projection even real? Where, where did that number come from? Uh, well, nobody asked it, that it's, question. It's way, de- is, it, it's way deeper than that. 
Is well, there yeah. in the contract it's, written that there's a flat flat rate of eight hundred thousand coming to Fanny Athletics? I don't know. I've never nobody, seen the, that contract. Somebody knows. Well, I, I, as you said, uh, we we had our we, we had our promoter on uh, a few a few months back. Uh, that was a question that came up, and he he pointed out that. Again, Kofi, you called it out. If we're having a thirty-one million dollar impact on the city of Orlando, we're we're making less than a million dollars off that game. Just, I mean, unacceptable. Thirty-one million dollar, thirty-one million dollar impact. You are getting eight hundred. Nah, let's say a million. Okay, I'll, I'll round up between eight hundred thousand two boos. Between the two schools, you get a million sits or something like that. Yeah. The bottom yeah. line, the bottom line is none of this is adding up. And if we sit back and allow this narrative to play out without confronting these people, it's on us. It's really, really, really on us. It's really because we're looking at something right now that is giving us a whole bunch of information right now if you care about fam you and the direction of fam you your antenna should have been up you know and there should be a feeling uh you should be angry because i'm definitely angry um regarding just the level of i want to say deception and incompetence that i'm seeing play out uh, across the board. If Tampa offered FAMU and Bethune Cookman more money, more money, I mean, they're an hour away from each other. What's the difference? They're what offering that, more Kelly? money. And we don't that? take that? That's ridiculous. Calvin, what year was that? Um, I believe the last time that it was up for bid and that it was actually bid, it probably would have been. This is me guessing because I don't have the information right in front of me, probably about 10 years ago. All right. Um, wow. My, again, the numbers, the numbers should scratch you, your head, should be scratching. You should be scratching your head, people. I, I know Michael Smith is probably scratching his head. Um, and I we well, let's end this on this. We talked about offline, we were talking about what we want to see in an athletic director. And, and I think for myself, I would like to see someone that does have and a lot of other things are great, but I would love to see someone who has a business mindset, uh, has an attention to details that can create, I don't know if you want to call them subcommittees or departments that operate fluidly within the umbrella of your business, your athletic department business. Because there are so many things, there are so many moving parts that go into a functional athletic department. And, th and I'm just talking internally. There are so many internal things that need to happen. Uh, I mean, I know people want vision. I know people want to grow the brand. I know all these other things, but at some point, I think I'm not saying we have to not do those things, but I, I for one, would like to see somebody who has a business mindset and can sort of make these books, make these numbers make sense. Because I feel like we're leaving money out on on the on the floor. So we need someone, yes, who can go fundraise. But I, I really would like to see someone with a business mindset and a business approach to building your organization. What about you, Kelvin? What do you want to see? So, 
So what I want to see is somebody who's experienced, number one. I mean, who's really ran from a financial, like you're saying, I believe, I agree with you with the business model, but somebody who's done the finance of a program from top to bottom, who understand the numbers, because because that way you can put together realistic budgets and you can start to put together some of the other things I talked about in terms of a capital campaign and the uh, the uh, athletic facilities uh, master plan, right? Um, and along, along with the P3 that's already out there. So you need somebody who already understands this stuff who can come in and hit the ground running. Also, the, with the person being experienced, they need to be transparent and not afraid to lose their job, right? Because what, cause, cause what this next person is going to have to do, they're going to have to, they're going to have to fight to get us where we need to be from where we are, right? And it's not going to be easy, all right? Because that requires a cultural change. There are things that have been institutionalized into our, our, our program and how we look at athletics. And that has to all be reversed. And it's not going to happen overnight. But it can't happen until we acknowledge it. And, and, and then, you know, we've got to be bullies about this thing. If you want to be champions and have a championship program consistently, this is what has to happen. And so I don't want people to feel dejected. Can you don't feel dejected and have headaches. We just got to get to work. It's going to require work. That's what, that's what those who benefit from this situation, that's what they want you to do. They want you to be discouraged. And to say that, you know, don't worry about it. We'll just show up and have a good time and so forth. No. Our players, our coaches, our program deserve better than that. And we, we now is our time. It's our time now, right? Rattler Nation, it's our time. We talk, talk about we the best at this and that. And we are good at a lot of things. Let's, let's, let's fix our house. But we need somebody, AD, who's experienced and somebody who gonna, ain't, ain't going to get along and get along, so to speak, right? You're gonna be on the island, but it, but it's okay, cause you got you got the numbers and you got right behind you, and, and when, once you start winning, when once you once we start right right in this ship, and, and we win in, in all programs consistently, you know everybody gonna be on board, but to get there it's gonna take a lot of work. Kofi, what do you want to see? Uh, like Kelvin, man, I, I want to see somebody that is, um, I want to see somebody experienced, but more important, before that experience, I want to see somebody and know that we have somebody that is committed um, because the winds are going to blow around this position. There's going to be all kind of troubled water, but you cannot be moved. You have to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water so that when our season comes, we can bear fruit in our season. Um, we can't allow trouble to uproot us. We can't allow controversy to uproot us. We can't allow pain and foolishness and uh, I'll start to say something else, uh, uproot us. You've got to be committed. You, I want somebody that genuinely wants to do the work and be at Florida a &M University. Uh, in addition to that, I want somebody with athletics, intelligence, and innovation. Um, we're going to be presented with all kinds of problems, but with every problem, um, there is an answer provided that we're able to do the work. You know, let's do the work. I want somebody that is going to creatively find a way to do it within the boundaries of the framework that has been given, that's willing to do it. And while we're at it, let's change the system. Somebody with that willingness and creativity and that boldness to say, this needs to change. This has to change. Um, and then I also want to see a higher degree of transparent communication, you know, to be able to continue to give us updates on where we are right now, where we are going, and how we're going to get there. Again, that's what vision comes down to. Vision speaks to where we are now. It acknowledges the fact that we are in this place but it doesn't leave us in this place. It says, okay, this is where we are right now. This is where we're going. And here is the strategy for us to get there. 
That's what I want to see from our next uh, from our next leaders. I want this person to be ready to hit the ground running on day one. I don't need them learning the land. I don't need them getting out here and, and you know being fearful. You know talking to uh, the wrong people, the wrong group of people that have their own agendas. I need them to have some the the type of. I, I need to add this. I want the next AD to have kahunas. Kahunas. I want them to have kahunas because you're going to need some kahunas when you come up on the highest of seven hills because you might have to separate and tell some people to go sit your hand down somewhere and let me do my job. Hey, right, uh, I'm done. I'm done. EA, EA, <laughs> I, I, I want to say, look, I, 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 we, we cannot allow whoever is hired to be sabotaged A again no more sabotage let's, let's if you watching tonight i want you to put that on the screen i want you to put it on the screen no more sabotage we not putting up with that no more no more sabotage that means if it's the administration if it's general counsel if it's people off around no more sabotage it can be a government it can be a government official no more sabotage we ain't dealing with that no more no more sabotage no more self sabotage because much of the stuff that happens on the highs of seven hills comes from our people it comes from us wrong motives wrong agendas selfish agendas ignorant agendas wrong agendas you know from our own people no more sabotage. You listening on the night. I want you to put that and go away with that mindset. No more sabotage. We ain't taking this no more. No more sabotage. We live, we have the means this day and age to call out the sabot, uh, the saboteurs. We have them. It, it, this is not like 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. Where you you know you had you, you talked about it in in the back rooms in the, in the pubs and the clubs and 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 in the, in the living rooms and and you knew you you all know who the saboteurs are and we talked about it laughed about it shook our head and then we went about our business doing that for thirty years is why we are in the position we are in today. There's this thing called social media. We don't have to let the saboteurs win. We don't have to let them have their way. We can start a movement just as quickly now than ever before. So when we have a show like this and when we talk about it and we tell people, go to the board of trustees meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. Go no more frat the, agendas. Go, yeah. What? Go to the board. Go to the the, the general meeting at two o'clock in the grand ballroom, and make your voice heard. Make your vote vote of no con confidence known. It can happen, and now's the time for it to happen. Unlike any other period before in FAMU history, this is what is in front of us, folks. So we have great coaches. And that was one thing I, I really, I'm glad Coach Shoot said. We really have some great coaches. If you don't want to lose those coaches, then you got to stand up to the saboteurs. And if you have the financial influence to stand up to the saboteurs, we especially need you. Because we understand sometimes folks only listen to money. So between those of us with a voice, those of us with our platforms, those of us with our dollars, we have to stand up and let the saboteurs know your time is done. We can't allow you to continue to bring us down and hold us down for your cheap, petty benefits. You want a plaque, give them a plaque, put them in the hall somewhere, and then let's move forward. If your leadership is not on point and doesn't include what we all know and consider to be the front doorstep to our university and that's this great athletic program and these eight great athletic programs that we have if our leadership doesn't recognize that we need to remove those leaders 
They have to go. They just have to. We cannot continue to do the same thing for another 30 years. Your children, your grandchildren deserve a better FAMU. Kofi said, do more with more. We have to stop doing more with less. That was 30, 40 years ago. Those, that's done. That's done. It's time to move forward. Do more with more. So that's our charge. That's our pledge to you, Rattler Faithful, yeah. Rattler Nation, alums. Yeah, we ain't going nowhere. Hey, hey, we yeah. I'm, my, my, my sign off is this program is not going anywhere. We're going to no, stay here. We're going no. to educate. We're going to cheer. And we're going to correct. And we're going to challenge. And we're going to educate. And, and, and it's not going anywhere. We're committed. We are committed. And we want yes, you sir. all to be committed, too. Well said. Um, thank you to everybody who who stayed in. Uh, definitely uh, working off of our our, uh, our our extended you, different show times. Uh, thank you to Thanks, our Roy. producer Roy, uh, big time for for hanging in there and making this possible. Um, you guys, Kelvin, Kofi, appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Lori, thank you, Brian. The, the super 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 moderator in the chat room dealing with those bots. And even I, I, some other people must have got out of hand. I know she she kicked a few people's comments out of there. So uh, shout out to you, Dr. Lori. Appreciate you. Uh, everybody watching on Facebook, thank you. Uh, go be a part of the process and be a part of the change. Don't just pop bottles and and get dressed up like models. Uh, let's go make it. Let's go make a difference tomorrow. Tomorrow's a big day in FAMU history. I, I I feel like it's going to be a big day. It should be a big day in FAMU history. We move forward starting tomorrow. So which direction? I mean, are we moving forward with a strong step, or are we going to continue to shuffle our feet and and turn to the side and and, and sidestep these problems? You guys have heard it. You know what's going on. That's going to do it for our show. Make sure you follow us at ONG Strike Zone, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Go download the Jericho Broadcast Networks app on your Google or Apple Play Store. Find my JBN or my BCSN is where you can find us. If you have any questions or thoughts, send us an email, ongstrikezone at gmail.com. Whenever you download the show, uh, share it with a friend. Make sure to hit the like button on Facebook and on YouTube. BCSN Pod Zone. BCSN Pod Zone is where the podcast will be. Make sure to give us a rating when you're out there. Uh, we are a part of the Black College Sports Network, the only show dedicated to Florida A&M University athletics and culture. That's going to do it. Everybody in Tallahassee, be safe, be smart, be strong. Don't let the saboteurs win. Step up, stand up, speak out. That's going to do it for the guys. Kofi, Kelvin, I'm Brian. Rattler Nation, go hard tomorrow. Strike hard tomorrow. Go strike. Strike. And strike again, baby. Good night. Peace out.